Good evening. Want to welcome everybody out tonight to the Andrew Breitbart Freedom Center here at the Heartland Institute. You're gonna, we're going to have a lot of fun tonight with Dr. Rich Vetter talking about higher education. So Dr. Vetter, is, I've known him now the whole time I've been here, but he's been a Heartland policy advisor and a friend of Heartland pretty much, I think, since it began. So he's been around helping us for a long time. His policy his, is on economics. He's a policy advisor on economics, but he also does a lot of work with higher education with us. And he's currently a professor at the University of Ohio. And he's taught at multiple different schools and stuff, but let's welcome Dr. Vetter and have him come on up here and we can hear from him on higher education. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, as Jim said, uh, First of all, I'm a native Illinoisan uh, who went to college just 22 miles away from here in Evanston at Northwestern. Uh, go Wildcats! Uh, uh, and I also have a couple degrees from the University of Illinois. So uh, indeed, all of my formal education took place in the land of Lincoln. Uh, and. Uh, Moreover, icing on the cake, uh, as Jim mentioned, I've had a very happy and long association uh, with the Heartland from its earliest days. Joe uh, Bask nodded his head, and Diane, uh, we go back to the beginning, I think, uh, in the mid-'80s. And uh, 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 I uh, am very glad, therefore, to be here. Uh, I think it's perhaps since I'm here to talk about my book, Restoring the Promise, Higher Education in America, it's perhaps a fitting in a way and appropriate for me to r ruminate about colleges near where I first became exposed to them uh, six decades ago. By the way, I'm in my 55th year of teaching. I still teach, uh, uh, much to the consternation of the university administration where I am, who can't find a le legitimate way to get rid of me, although they've tried very hard. Uh, American universities are in trouble. The semester just ended saw enrollments decline for the eighth consecutive year, unprecedented in modern American history. The decline is present at state schools and private schools, at four-year as well as two-year colleges, among full-time as well as part-time uh, students, at for-profit as well as not-for-profit institution. Nationwide, at four-year public schools, for example, more than 66,000 fewer students attended this last semester that just ended compared with a year ago. In Illinois, it's even worse, total higher education enrollments were down 5.0% or over 30,000 students uh, spring of this year compared with the previous year. And all indications are this enrollment decline will continue this fall. Many schools, for example, are scrambling for students. Uh, don't let your teenage child or grandchild alone on the streets or she or he may be kidnapped by a university admissions counselor. Uh, and because the old-fashioned recreation of producing children for some reason seems to be losing favor, uh, the pool of 18 to 22 year olds in the Midwest will be smaller a decade from now than it is today. Uh, university presidents and your current governor in Illinois, Mr. Pritzker, no doubt, given his propensity to tax, will probably start lobbying for taxes on condoms and the outlawing of vasectomies as a way to try to boost the college age population. Now, this did not happen by accident. Americans are starting to question the very utility of going to college. Why? I think American higher education suffers from three big problems. Three pro I use, by the way, no PowerPoint. Uh, the, the, 
Harlan pays very little, so you don't get a PowerPoint. I call this West Virginia PowerPoint. I use my fingers. Uh, three problems. First, higher education is too expensive. Second, there are growing doubts about how much do kids learn while in school. Third, there is a mismatch between the vocational expectations of college students and their parents and the realities of labor markets, even at a time when the unemployment rate is at near a historic low. The New York Federal Reserve Bank said that in March of this year, 41.3% of recent college graduates were underemployed, working as baristas at Starbucks, clerks at Home Depot, home health care aides, janitors doing un uh, unskilled construction work, etc. A few words about the cost of college. When I first started studying at Northwestern University in the middle of the last century, the annual tuition fee was $795. That is less than $7,000 in today's dollars. In the academic year just completed, those fees were $54,120. That doesn't include room and board. That's just basic tuition, about eight times as much as when I went to school, even allowing for inflation. Similarly, uh, I'll be similar, I'll be at uh, somewhat more modest in increases have been shown by all, virtually all other American universities. The cost of college has ri risen dramatically more than the rate of inflation, and ominously, much more than family incomes, which is non-sustainable in the long run. Uh, uh, or otherwise, at some point, we would starve to death paying our tuition uh, for our kids. While the financial burden of buying plane tickets or telephone service or hamburgers or computers uh, have fallen sharply over time with technological progress and economic growth, this is not true of college. Part of the problem is stagnant productivity. Most universities today have more employees per student than they did a half a century ago, with the possible exception of prostitution. Teaching is the only profession I know that has had absolutely no productivity advance in the 2,400 years since Socrates taught the youth of Athens. Even housing and food costs are rising far more for college kids than for the general public. Using the university that I teach at, Ohio University, a typical uh, Midwestern public university as an example, a standard double room costs $7,060 for less than nine months of that constitutes the school year. That is $784 a month for a small room shared with a roommate, probably with a public bathroom shared but with many others down the hall. Now as for food, I check this out, the lowest cost meal plan costs $5,906, giving only 14 meals a week, forget breakfast, for perhaps 30 weeks or over $14 a meal. You can eat for less at McDonald's or eat probably even Applebee's or somewhere. So, moreover, unlike the private restaurant providers, universities typically don't pay sales or property taxes. The room and board charges at Northwestern are actually higher than at my university, I noticed, about 20% higher. They used to do laundry for you there when I was at school there. I don't suppose they don't do that anymore. Uh, so why have these risen? There are tons of explanations, and we don't have time to look into them all. The rate of tuition inflation, however, greatly accelerated with the advent of federal financial assistance programs, 
uh, particularly uh, student loans. Colleges said, we can raise our fees uh, far more aggressively now. The kids will just borrow from the federal government. And to some extent, that reasoning applied to state legislatures as well. We have a former Wisconsin, a reformed Wisconsin uh, state legislator sitting in the room. Uh, so also apply to state legislators who reason we don't need to prioritize subsidizing university as much as we used to because the, even the poor kids can go borrow enough money to get through school. So as tuition fees have risen, colleges have used much of the added money to engage in an academic arms race. Aside from building fancy show places with atriums or recreational facilities with climbing walls and lazy rivers, schools have added a massive numbers of bureaucrats. At the university that I teach at, in the early 1970s, there were approximately two faculty members for every administrator. Now the number of administrators exceeds the number of faculty, and that's true all over the country. At the University of Michigan, there are 93 diversity coordinators. In 1950, there weren't any, and if you said, how, how, how many diversity coordinators do you have? The first question would be, what in the hell is a diversity coordinator? Anyway, sorry about that. <laughs> My university has a vice president for diversity and inclusion. As I say, 50 years ago, no one would know what that term meant. A lot of universities have secretaries of state now. They call them something like vice provost for global affairs or something like that. Uh, now, our students learning as much as they did 50 years ago? Probably not. Although colleges are in the knowledge business, they're very reluctant to collect and publish data on what their students are learning. Probably, ca probably because the results are so embarrassing. Federal data on literacy suggests a decline in reading comprehension among college graduates. The civic literacy test administered by the Intercollegiate Studies Institute shows that college seniors have very little more knowledge of basic American institutions and our heritage than do freshmen. At Yale, the seniors knew less than the freshmen. Don't send your kid to Yale. But don't send them to Harvard either. I've been bashing Harvard a lot lately, by the way. Someone, you know, that's a good one to applaud to, you know. I, I, I really want to tell you a story about that, but I, we'll, we'll wait to questions. A massive study come, uh, sponsored by the National Research Council using the respected critical learning assessment shows that college seniors have only marginally better critical reasoning or even reading skills than freshmen. Now much of the reason for this is very simple. College students on average spend dramatically less time studying today than they did in the mid-1960s. According to federal government, an average of 27 hours weekly now compared with 40 hours in 1960. Do the math, 27, 30 weeks in school, that's 810 hours. Do the same thing for an eighth grader, more hours. Eighth graders are studying more than college students. Now, since grades have gone up dramatically, students have fewer incentives to work hard while in college. More. So for decades, the earnings differential from having a college degree compared with a high school diploma was rising throughout the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, for example. But the evidence for the last decade has suggested that differential has peaked and may now be declining. Indeed, since, since 2015, the last four years, earnings have risen far more for high school graduates 
than for college graduates. As we have an, seemingly an oversupply of highly educated people, but not enough people to stock the grocery shelves, care for the elderly, uh, mop the floors, and all the all sorts of things that don't require a college degree. Wages are rising nicely at Home Depot and Walmart. Walmart pays on average uh, $17 an hour now, including fringe benefits. And to be sure, we are in a very tight labor market today, and that may change a year from now or two, but that's what it is. Now, because of time limitations, I will not talk about many problems discussed extensively in my book. I don't know how long I'm supposed to talk, but I am a college professor with tenure, so I'll talk as long as I want. Uh, uh, so I won't talk about a lot of things. For example, intercollegiate athletics is becoming extremely costly and mired in, in scandals. There's a moral dimension to that as well. Younger persons, especially highly skilled college athletes, are being ruthlessly exploited by their coaches who make as much as 100 times as much as they do. Uh, my university loses over $20 million annually supporting ball throwing and related contests uh, that have virtually nothing to do with job one of uh, disseminating or creating knowledge. You read about the Varsity uh, Blues mission scandal, which was all about uh, faking the tennis playing qualities of students. Why a kid would ever want to go to the University of Southern California anyway is beyond me. Uh, anyway. Now there is, additionally, there is increasing concerns that universities are not promoting diverse ideas, often suppressing views that are not politically incorrect, or, or politically correct, which is the very antithesis of what universities are supposed to do. Tolerate and even promote a full discussion of all viewpoints, some of them positively crazy and harebrained. I must say the University of Chicago has proved to be something of a force for good in this area uh, with its Chicago principles that says students should confront diverse and uncomfortable ideas as part of their learning process. Faculty teaching loads are sharply lower than when I began teaching, supposedly to support research but much of that research, research results in publication of little red articles on obscure topics for even more obscure journals, like the Journal of Last Resort. <laughs> there were 21,000 articles written on William Shakespeare in published journals between 1985 and 2005, a little over a thousand uh, a year, three a day, one every eight hours, day and night. Now Shakespeare was a wonderful man, uh, but are there really 21,000 new insights we've had into Shakespeare in the 400 years since he died? Anyway. What are the implications of all these sobering trends? Until recently, colleges, even poorly performing ones, have been significantly sheltered from bankruptcy by massive government subsidies and, in some cases, private philanthropy. These subsidies are not growing as much now, partly because of a slowdown in the rate of economic growth uh, since 2000 for a whole variety of reasons, many of which Heartland ta has told you about. Uh, partly because of declining public support of higher education and partly because of other physical imperatives such as caring for a rapidly growing older population in, in an era of massive public deficits. Therefore, I would be surprised if fewer than 500 schools close over the next decade or so. The pace is already, uh, Clay Christensen at Harvard says 2,000 schools are going to close, half of them. The pace is already picking up. Several small liberal arts colleges have recently closed in New England, for example. In Illinois, enrollments have fallen precipitously at some of the major schools. 
I believe enrollment, I checked it the other day, at Southern Illinois University's main Carbondale campus is down over 40% from the level it was in the mid-1980s. And Eastern Western Illinois universities have been dealing with financial crises uh, as enrollments crash. Enrollment at Chicago State is probably asymptotically approaching zero. There is a flight to quality in higher education. Enrollments are not falling in the Ivy League. Indeed, one or two of the Ivy League schools are actually expanding modestly their enrollments. People want the best, so applications are high at the top schools. The top Big Ten school reputation-wise, um, Northwestern and the University of Michigan uh, are, relatively speaking, prospering. And the Urbana-Champaign campus of the U of I is doing okay, except for having to deal with a seriously dysfunctional state government. Virginia Tech is bribing accepted students this fall to delay their campus arrival for a year because of potentially overcrowded student housing. But the lower quality state schools and poorly endowed liberal arts colleges with limited reputation are in trouble. In the course of a few recent years, Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio, had its financial reserves fall by over $100 million, and they actually contemplated selling buildings in order to meet the payroll. They're still recovering from a three-week faculty strike that disrupted education. In this area, Chicago State is a mess, careening towards disappearance, and I'm not making that up. According to the U.S. Department of Education website, the graduation rate after six years of attendance at the uh, Chicago State is 15%. And the average annual earnings after attending is less than $34,000 a year, about what a typical full-time worker with a high school diploma would earn at Walmart. Only one in four students at Chicago State has paid down $1 of their student debt within three years after finishing school. Does the average student entering Chicago State benefiting from that school? I doubt it. Why do we allow it to exist? Although I don't have time to talk much about it, the accreditation system is, that is supposedly a quality control and consumer information device is extremely ineffective. Indeed, an embarrassment. Accreditors often look more at inputs rather than outcomes, are rife with conflicts of interests, <laughs> seldom eliminate truly horrible educational situations that effectively victimize consumers. They are costly, they lack transparency, and they have other problems which we don't have time to talk about. In the entrepreneurial private sector, which dominates American economic activity, fortunately, markets, competition, and the profit motive work to discipline firms to provide products and services that people want and to seek efficiencies in producing those goods. Companies who miss the boat in doing this literally die. What Sh Joseph Schumpeter once called creative destruction. While those who find new ways to please people prosper, none of the top U.S. corporations in terms of capitalization, Amazon, Google, Apple, Microsoft, even existed 50 years ago. Yet such earlier giants as Eastman Kodak, Enron, and U.S. Steel are either dead today or shadows of their former selves. In 1980, the Continental Illinois Bank and the First National Bank of Chicago were the top banks in the Chicago area. Neither even exists in those forms today. By contrast, in higher education, there are seldom big changes because government subsidies keep creative destruction from working very much. The top 20 universities, according to U.S. News & World Report, in 1918 were exactly 
the same 20 as in 2005, with one minor exception. Tulane replaced Emory, which in Emory, though, is not in the top 20. They were 21st. So as in, but as enrollments start to decline and people question the value proposition of higher education more, the possibility of failure is growing. What to do? Thank you very much. No. <laughs> Damned if I know. <laughs> uh, in, my, in my opinion, most of the problems of higher education are the fault of government at both the state and federal levels. The case for university involvement in higher education or, for, or rather for government involvement in higher education is actually shockingly weak. Three arguments are usually uh, used to support government support. First, universities supposedly have positive externalities or spillover effects, meaning the benefits of college accrue not only to those attending, but to the broader society. To society. Second, governments make investments in human capital as a way of expanding prosperity and economic growth. Third, universities allegedly are instruments to improve income equality, to provide the poor access to education needed to become prosperous. All of these arguments are weak. Uh, my econometric analysis of the data says that state governments that invest heavily in higher ed because of their spillover effects actually have lower, not higher, lower rates of economic growth. You take money from a highly productive, efficient, competitive sec sector, disciplined by markets, and give it to an extremely inefficient sector devoid of any incentives to be efficient. That's what we do when we give money to universities. And massive government subsidies of higher ed have occurred concurrently with a rise, not a fall, in income inequality as conventionally measured. A good argument can be made that we have created academic, gated academic communities of pseudo-aristocrats, those full uh, aristocracy largely financed by federal and to much less extent state governments. By the way, Harvard gets much more public money per student, much more than the University of Massachusetts which is a state school. So the notion that private schools are somehow private and public schools are somehow uh, receive government subsidy, that idea is just completely wrong. Put that out of your mind. Um, all right. I suppose we're running short on time here. <laughs> Joe, go get me a beer. No. <laughs> uh, no. No, I, I uh, that's tempting, though. Uh, uh, today, uh, universities today, even the so-called private ones, are wards of the state. They're heavily dependent on government grants for research or subsidies for student attendance. The, and they derive enormous benefits from favorable provisions in the tax codes that, for example, allow in endowments to grow robustly at schools like Chicago and Northwestern. The increase in governmental entanglements with universities have contributed mightily to our current problems. Government loan and grant programs have pushed up tuition fees, fueling an unproductive academic arms race. Excessive regulation on everything from research into human subjects to affirmative action efforts are costly, contributing to the administrative bloat that is serving to steer universities universities increasingly away from their key roles of promoting teaching and research. Particularly egregious have been the attempts to interfere in the internal affairs of universities, especially regarding instances, instances of alleged sexual assaults. The violation of basic principles of legal justice has been horrendous, and the institution of star chamber justice has been appalling and should frighten any believer in the principles of Anglo-American jurisprudence that have evolved since the Magna Carta was signed eight centuries ago. 
A historical note here. This might interest you. Most of the problems mentioned before, just now, at least are partly associated with the United States Department of Education. That department did not even exist 40 years ago. What has happened to the quality of higher education in America since? Learning has declined. Our research superiority over other nations is starting to ebb away. We still have 40% of students dropping out of school uh, within six years. After six years, 40% uh, have dropped out, not graduated. Costs have roughly tripled, allowing for inflation. The Department of Education has tried to institute miniature Spanish inquisitions on American campuses, although I will say that Secretary Betsy DeVos seems to be trying to reverse that. Now, the efforts to create the Department of Education barely succeeded in, in 1979, despite huge Democratic majorities in Congress. The bill to create it got out of the House Education Committee on a 20 to 19 vote, with seven Democrats voting against it, and passed the whole House with a total of 215 votes, less than a majority because some just simply didn't vote. It was opposed by the leading Democratic Party intellectual of the era, uh, Central, Senator Daniel Patrick Monaghan, and by the New York Times and the Washington Post. They were against it. I love it. Even progressives of the era were wary of creating a bureaucratic morass in Washington to oversee a generally responsibly well-running and highly decentralized system of universities. What should we do about it all? I would love to kill the US Department of Education, but it would likely not happen soon. We should privatize, however, student financial aid. Ideally, this means ending over a period of time the federal grant programs, but most especially federal student loans. The government does not help us finance our private investments or help us buy our cars, why should it be involved in financing private investments in colleges, investments made for the personal economic advantage of those attending? Short of a complete ending of the system, uh, three things could be done that would be somewhat useful. First, universities should have some skin in the game. An idea that's promoted, by the way, by a Chicagoan quite a bit, former Chicago home loan bank president and Lake Forest resident, uh, banking scholar Alec Pollack. Some universities knowingly accept students they know from their high school record and test scores have an extremely low probability of success. Yet the schools take them anyway, induce them to take out large student uh, loans, and then after some period, the kids drop out of school and default on their loans. If the schools had to shoulder some of the cost of the loan default, I'd predict that there would be a decline in student dropouts and loan defaults. Another idea, perhaps, whose time has probably come are income share agreements, or ISAs. With an ISA, a student contracts with a financial service provider to pay for a certain part of the cost of college. With a student obliged to repay the investor a certain percentage of earnings for a certain number of years after completing school. The risk shift from comparatively uninformed and inexperienced young students to seasoned investors. The burden moves from the government to the private sector. In one form or other, it's a financial vehicle that has been in use for over 300 years, and the time has come for it to be tried meaningfully in higher ed. Some schools, notably Purdue University, whose president, by the way, Mitch Daniels, is probably the best thing we have going right now in public uh, higher ed. Uh, 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 Purdue's using ISAs, as are so many private coding academies who are becoming a new competing force against degree uh, granting schools and I think a, a healthy uh, development. At the state level, probably funding should be moved from the providers, the producers of services, to the consumers of those services. 
Heartland's been saying that for years with regards to K through 12. Why not college? This means giving vouchers or scholarships to students and privatizing so-called state universities, removing subsidies to them, but giving them freedom to charge the fees they want, alter their government governing body, be free of state rules and prevailing wages and other cost-enhancing regulations and so forth. Uh, I think schools like the University of Virginia and the University of Michigan are prime targets for privatization since they get less than 10% of their money now from the government, state government. Despite contrary political uh, predilections, universities are fundamentally conservative institutions in their own personal behavior. They're resistant to change. Governance is typically muddled. Usually in business, for example, the president is the boss, and he hires and fires subordinates. Whereas in higher education, occasionally, the employees fire the bosses, as Harvard's Larry Summers can attest. All major players think they have some quasi ownership right in the university, and that makes decisive, bold decision-making difficult. Thus, outside pressures, no doubt, will be needed to affect change. I'm almost done, folks. Isn't this wonderful? Don't you feel like you'd rather be at a local hospital having a hemorrhoid operation? <laughs> The three key words for effective change all start with the letter I. Information, incentives, and innovation. Too many kids make poor education choices based on faulty or misleading information. They're not fully aware of the differences in vocational outcomes based on such fundamental choices as the school that they attend or the major field of study. They vastly underestimate the risks of college attendance. Colleges lie about the risks. I wouldn't buy a used car from a typical university president. <laughs> Now, unlike the for-profit public sector, there are few big rewards for success in higher ed. And incentives to be efficient or super good are pretty weak. And higher ed still performs its operations the same way as medieval universities in Europe did 600 years ago, by and large. Um, there is, however, I should leave on a somewhat hopeful note, I guess, there is, however, some basis for hope. Humans do respond to adversity. As Plato said more than two millennia ago, necessity is the mother of invention. It's in the Republic. Without the incentives created by market forces, change comes slower in higher ed, but it does come. Schumpeterian creative discussion is beginning to overcome the subsidies shielding schools from change, and hundreds, if not thousands, of institutions will close over the next decade or so. Let's hope that we overcome the obstacles to change and redirect higher America's higher learning in a way that leads to more knowledge being created and disseminated at an affordable cost and that allows open inquiry and relates the educational mission to our nation's vocational needs. Thank you very much. As we get ready to do Q&A, here's one to make sure everybody knows the rules. We'll have a couple people with mics. Wait till the mic comes to you to ask your question. The person holding the mic will continue to hold the mic. Uh, we have cameras, so they'll rotate those cameras, so you're actually going to be asking on, uh, so everybody online can see and hear your question as well. And anybody online, please feel free to put your question in the chat, and we'll make sure that get at, gets asked as well. Um, so does anybody have any questions to start off with tonight? Wow. 
Right here, Jim Johnston. Here you go, Jim. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you for coming and presenting such a wonderful thesis in good humor, yet very critical. You mentioned the University of Chicago being a possibly at least partial uh, refuge for diversity of thought. At uh, 30, 35 years ago, the University of Chicago had the Young Spartacus League that would come out and demonstrate whenever something of, of importance, like how much money they would get. But there was a countervailing organization called the Running Dogs, and they would, sponsor, they would demonstrate against the Sparts, as they were known. Now, the full name of the Running Dogs were the Bourgeois Capitalist Running Dogs Lackey Society. <laughs> and be assured that their spirit lives on here at the Heartland Institute. And that may be an, a lesson that the spirit of freedom exists in nonprofits rather than in universities. Jim, that's a very good point. And indeed, I talk a little bit in my book about this. There are competitions within, for, in the world of ideas outside the university environment of which the Heartland Institute is a beautiful example. Thank God for the Heartland Institute and the Independent Institute and a whole variety of new non-university forms of uh, intellectual inquiry. Milton Friedman was talking about ISOs 50 years ago. Exactly. So why hasn't this spread? Why isn't this a private sector, free market solution to the problem? Well, I think it is. Why it didn't catch on? I don't know. Uh, I genuinely don't know. Uh, it's hard for a professor to admit that he doesn't know something. And I could make up something, but I'd rather just say, I don't really know why it didn't catch on. Uh, Larry Greenberg, uh, question to, there's been a lot of grade inflation, a lot of, um, uh, just a lot of uh, blowing up uh, out of proportion uh, what goes on in four-year schools especially. So uh, as part of a solution, to what extent do employers in the non-technical fields have a role in uh, essentially saying this is what we really need for employees uh, and maybe uh, maybe four-year colleges in uh, underwater basket weaving are not, not uh, required? The wonderful question. And, and I must say one of the greatest frustrations I have is trying, I've been trying to work on organizations like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Why don't you get out there? Why don't you come up with some sort of national I call it college equivalency tests, which a kid could take at any age to show how much they know. And you could tell whether a kid at the age of 14 who goes to some school in Chicago may know more than the average University of Chicago graduate. Give them a bachelor's degree as far as I'm concerned, or the equivalent. Why don't the, why don't the uh, uh, companies, corporations who get involved in doing more and they have they just ignore, they've dropped the ball, I think. And I don't know why, but I, I kind of know why. They say, we don't pay for the cost of college. It's the kids that pay. That cost has already been incurred up front. We get the finished product. Uh, but I think they do pay. I think they do pay because they pay a college graduate, even now 80% more or something, a high school graduate. And that differential wouldn't exist if we had some of these other uh, ways of uh, evaluating uh, performance. Uh, the average GPA at a typical university uh, today, uh, uh, using a four-point system, four being A, B being a three, uh, C being a two, D being a one, the average grade point average is now be a little above 3.1, between 3.1 and 3.2. In 1960, it was below 2.5. Uh, in other words, in 1950, a typical grade would have been B minus C plus, and of course, a lot of freshmen and sophomores even got lower grades below C average. 
uh, and seniors got a little higher, but that that was the rule. And now it's 3.1, 3.2. Uh, I think that ought to change. That That is something that there are ways to deal with. There, uh, uh, Universe, uh, state governments could say, I, I, I don't like state governments getting involved in university business, but state governments could say, we're not going to give money to any university whose average G point, GPA is above a 2.7 or something like that. They could say that. The state of Illinois could say that. You're not going to get any money unless you do. They'd shape up fast. <laughs> All right, so we have Robert here, then Nancy, then Robert McGregor, then you'll be coming, then what, George. Robert. Correct. Bob Johnson. I'm uh, an engineer. I've got my master's degree. I'm going to change the subject a little bit, but related to college education. Do you want to speak about the influx of foreigners in our educational system? Like U of I's got, what, 25 percent foreigners? And then the other issue that I'm plugged into is the use of foreign students in the foreign worker programs. If you ever Google a college and then put in my visa jobs, you'll see how the, the big colleges are using a lot of foreign uh, teaching assistants. Um, I'm shocked to hear that. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, yeah. I'm, 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 joke, I'm joking. In, in the math department at our school, it, we pray that the, the graduate students will speak a little English to, to the students. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting issue. Uh, you know, the one side of me says, I'm glad to see people from all over the world want to take advantage of our universities. I great believe in migration, uh, free migration of resources. But I uh, will tell you, without going into details, there are some interesting side effects of this, some of which are somewhat worrisome. Uh, I will not tell you the number of hours I have spent with national, uh, with, on national security issues as a professor uh, dealing with Chinese nationals stealing secrets, for example, and things of that nature. So there are some issues associated with that. Uh, on the whole, I, you know, the foreigners, foreign students, and until the restrictions in the last couple of years on the uh, Trump administration, I think, uh, have been the lifeblood of some of these universities because they've had decots and uh, state appropriations. University of California, uh, you know, is living off of foreigners, defined in the case of California as to being anyone living outside the People's Republic of California. <laughs> Uh, uh, anyone living outside of California, uh, th th that because uh, of state appropriation cuts, they've just taken uh, an enormous number of international students. Uh, uh, my university, nearly all the Maseratis and Lamborghinis and all these fancy cars, all ending in the letter I that I can't afford to drive, are driven by, in my little town of 20,000, by Chinese students. Uh, uh, where the hell they get their money, I don't know. Uh, but our university loves them because they pay full tuition out of state. Now, is that good educational policy? I think there's some issues there. And next question. Uh, I was going to mention the same thing, knowing that uh, universities depend on Chinese and other students from other state, and this is why they, of course, can raise their tuition because they know they're going to. Any the people out of state from China and other countries are going to pay any amount get get the children at the universities, so they survive by that. Another thing I read, which was very troubling to me, is that because of all this, uh, rather about China now and what they're doing and and Trump with the tariffs and what have you, they're there are people, the establishment and others, who are very, very worried because they're afraid that that's going to discourage the Chinese students from coming to America. And of course, this would greatly upset the universities. Yeah, that, yeah. You, you have, uh, you're right about that. <laughs> other comments, questions? Yes, sir. Um, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank Heartland for the good work that Heartland does. And I want to thank you for the encouraging, very optimistic speech that you gave tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my question is, how do we reach the citizens? 
Uh, the citizens mostly are uh, clueless. We keep electing the Pritzkers and the, my Congressman Foster and the Durbins and so on. What do we do? Our media largely supports all of this nonsense that you talked about. And, and the media is very influential. Heartland's voice is very important. But I'm involved with church groups and, and the seminaries and, and I, uh, I talked about uh, global warming and I used Heartland. What do I get from my church? Somebody writes me a paper how bad Heartland is. I'm on a Nile uh, having dinner with a, somebody from the high ranking person with the federal government, a very articulate person. He's for cl the climate agenda and I, I mentioned Heartland. I get a three page email how evil Heartland is and how bad it is. And so we've got to learn to do a much better job of communicating and we've got to address the media. The foundations used to be run by uh, people. I ran one of the better foundations in the country. The foundations have been taken over by the left. And so if you want to get th this kind of nonsense, you can get all kinds of money. So we've got a lot of work to do. We've got to elevate the, the message of Heartland and find a way to help get the message out. Thank you. Yeah, well, that I agree with that, and I, as I say, co the universities need competition, and the competition has to come from outside the academy, and that is the heartlands of the world. I would add one thing about universities. University trustees are clueless what's going on in the universities because they get all their information from the president of the university who is trying to increase his or her salary. So they hear all the good stuff. They never pick up the dirt, the bad news. And uh, so there's a communication problem even within the universities. But you're absolutely right. Jim Mitchell. Hi. My name is Jim Mitchell from Lindenhurst, Illinois. In addition to being graduating from a college, I've attended our local community college, College of Lake County. and. In your studies and in your things that you look for higher education, one of the things that I've noticed in the last 10 years for the community college is remedial education courses in English and math. And it's like they have 30 or 40 sections of each. And to me, that's become, I think, the local financial model. And I was wondering, has those kinds of things been part of your research? I've, I've looked some into that. Um, the results with respect to remedial education at the higher ed level are very disappointing. Uh, students, universities, first of all, we could talk at length about why do we need remedial education. And uh, that gets back to K through 12. There's a very poor articulation, as the word they use these days, between what the high schools do and the grade schools do and what the universities do. You even have different bureaucracies running the higher ed people as opposed to the K through 12. That's one of the problems. But we have a real problem there. Um, uh, remedial education isn't working well, but it's much needed because the kids are clueless. They're coming up with poor training. And so when the university presidents say, hey, we have to use what we have coming in. I mean, we can't, you know, we're not at fault for what the ignorance of kids coming in. They have a point when they say that. They do have a point. My, my follow-up point, I understand exactly what you said, but the problem is the College of Lake County creates the test for English and math, yeah. and it's a requirement to get into the math programs. Understandably, the students have some deficiencies, but what I found as a candidate in Lake County, there is no feedback from the College of Lake County back to the high schools uh, to show them where they need to improve. And so, by hey. default, the college has made a business model out of this, and the students are left in the lurch, as no. are the parents. The colleges are putting their own self-interest ahead of that of the students. That's been going on for years. Okay. Hi, I'm Bob Angelica. I recently read a book uh, edited by one or two people from the Cato Institute. I think it's called The Broken Tower. And it covers much of what you cover. I wrote a chapter in that book. Okay. So, yeah, it's a great book, uh, yeah. by the way, especially uh, chapter two. 
Uh, some of the contributors, and I can't remember who they are, have mentioned that over the years, faculty have ceded authority to the administrative bureaucracy in schools. Have you found that to be true? Oh, absolutely. Uh, when I started teaching, even at my mid-quality state university, the faculty, they didn't run everything, but they certainly controlled the curriculum. They uh, had a, a major role to play on things like admissions decisions, that sort of thing, anything to do with the academic area. Nowadays, uh, their role has been subordinated. They are, you know, viewed as just employees. And I think that's true at a lot of schools. It's less true at the very elite schools where they have a lot of very powerful superstar professors who bring in a lot of money who uh, they can't afford to uh, ignore. Uh, but uh, in general, the academic function is being crowded out by administrative functionaries who are clueless or don't care about things like teaching, research, uh, truth and beauty, uh, virtue, the things that colleges and universities should be concerned about. All right, in the back, Joseph, then we're gonna go to Frank, then to George, and then to Tony. Richard, uh, thank you for mentioning Chicago State because that's been a burr in my saddle for a long time. And also they're uh, across town, northeastern Illinois, with their abysmal graduation rates. Yeah. And I don't know if people realize the graduation rates, when you say graduation rates, that's a six-year number. Um, that's how many kids graduate in it, six years. Absolutely. Um, my question is, to what uh, responsibility do the accrediting agencies have to get these bad actors out of the system? And is that a, a, a point where we can be applying pressure? Or how does that whole accreditation system work? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I applaud you for that brilliant question. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, by the way, the former president at Chicago State, Wayne Watson, had a lawyer threaten to sue me for reporting some basic facts about his school. Uh, uh, the, the lawyers finally told Mr. Watson, who's no longer there, uh, that uh, that wouldn't work. Uh, the accreditation agencies should be protecting consumers. They should be providing information. They're doing very little of that. The accreditation to be, to be a university is the same for the University of Chicago as it is for Chicago State. Accreditation is treated like pregnancy. You either are or you're not. You either have it or you don't. In reality, there are graduations of excellence. They don't point this out at all. Moreover, their accreditation reports when they're released, usually the basic bottom line, you have been re-accredited, is reported to the public. Often underneath that, there are pages upon pages of documented examples of malfeasance, wrongdoing, mistakes, errors, weaknesses that are kept quiet from the public. There are, it's one thing that ought to happen is there ought to be a man, if this is one area where there would be a rule, room for a government law would be, these reports should be mandatorily made public if the school is receiving some sort of money. The accreditation is a sham in this country. It is an utter sham. The people who run the accreditation agency, their boards are made up of the universities that are accredited. You know, where would that happen anywhere else? I mean, total conflicts of interest. This is an area of big scandal, in my opinion. Uh, no one's going to go to jail for it, but it is an area of extreme weakness. I didn't really fully answer your question, but I agree with you 100%. Okay, Frank is next. Uh, well, one thing in Wisconsin, they've, the legislature has frozen tuition for the last six years and likely two more years. And all the terrible things that were claimed by the universities that were going to happen for the state universities, and there's many, uh, never, never came to be. Um, two different things I'd like you to just talk about a little bit. Uh, the first is, is the 
left-leaning curriculum, the left-leaning professors, and the indoctrination that many do, rather than the information and critical thinking that should be happening in universities. And I've talked to economics um, graduates of University of Madison and uh, Milton Friedman. Have you ever heard of him? Well, maybe vaguely. You know, what about von Mises? Yeah, who? So you get the curriculum is definitely tilted one direction, and you know talk a little bit about that and your experience inside the system. And then secondly, many universities, even the public universities, have huge endowment funds that either directly give tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars directly to the universities or provide scholarships or subsidies to the students who come into these universities, making that more attractive to them. And these folks are often have made their tens of millions or hundreds of millions, whatever they've contributed, and who sit on the board of directors or their children out of the private sector, doing private sector things and making their money in the private sector, but yet they hand it over carte blanche and let the universities do what they want with it, never ask back for, um, you know, what are you doing with my money or even what kind of results are you getting with my money? And they would never do that in the private sector. Two wonderful questions, each one of which I could talk a half hour about. I actually did a little study relating to the first one, uh, Frank. Uh, I went and looked at universities and I said, let's look at the people they bring in from the outside to speak at commencement and so forth. What kind of people do they bring in? What is their political orientation? I uh, looked at 7,000 different speakers. That's a lot for 200 schools in the United States. A lot of speakers didn't have political orientation at all. There were chemical engineers talking about some technical subject, uh, and uh, there was no political content at all. But of those that I could identify, there were about four times as many who were clearly on the left than on, on the right. You might be interested to know what school, kind of schools were the most leftist oriented, and those were the elite private liberal arts colleges, the Swarthmores, the, uh, dare I, f I, I won't mention, well, uh, the uh, Carlton's, the Oberlin, oh, Oberlin, I gotta call them out on Oberlin coming out next week in Forbes, oh my God. <laughs> the students, you know, went, demonstrated it at Oberlin because they served General Shaw's chicken or whatever they call that stuff because it isn't culturally appropriate so <laughs> but yeah and Oberlin has just law actually a 44 million dollar judgment against Oberlin it'll be reduced a little bit but I hope they get zapped that school uh, uh, no there's a, a, a left bias there's no question about it higher ed one thing that I've propose is just sort of a modest thing. I, I, I wrote a column and didn't get a lot of attention. I said, here's one thing that George Soros and Charles Koch could agree on. Uh, they won't agree on even, you know, is the sun coming up in the east or west tomorrow? They'll disagree on that. But they would agree that uh, they want their point of view articulated to students. So I said, why don't you have debates on campus? Bring in a lefty and bring in a right orient people just give some uh, differences of opinion so the students get some diversity of ideas. Why don't you guys each fund uh, you know, 200, 300 schools and have maybe six debates a year at each school? Don't you think it'd be a cool idea? It's nickel dime amount of money to do. And uh, I haven't heard from either Mr. Koch or Mr. Soros. Believe it or not, I've received money from both of them. Uh, it's hard to believe, but. Sometime I'll tell you, Diane uh, Bass is looking at me. Uh, <laughs> how did that happen? It's, it's an interesting how I pulled that one off. Uh, I'll take money from anyone, Diane. <laughs> uh, I, Frank's second, the second one was equally provocative. I forgot what it was, Frank. Uh, it's about the foundation money. Oh, foundation. I have done a study on f foundations, and it turns out <laughs> A large part of foundation money goes to line the pockets of people in the academy in a way that has very little productive use. I, 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 that's being a little harsh, but I think it's, I think it's true. And I, I mean, I've run regression equations. I've done a lot of statistical analysis on it. Um, 
my guess is for every dollar of endowment income, not uh, uh, principal, uh, the, the, the actual payment of a dollar of endowment money per student. If you give one more dollar per student in endowment, how much does that lower the cost of college? 11 or 12 cents. 88 cents go for something else. Buffett was, Warren Buffett was on the board of Grinnell College and he started the endowment was eight million when he left it was over a billion and he said it's amazing the endowment went up a hundredfold and the tuition just kept going up shouldn't some of that money have led to lower costs for college uh, and uh, it didn't and uh, there is a lot of uh, waste in endowments, there's a lot of s s many scandals. Frank, I, c I think given time limitation, can't go into more detail, but it is a, a cause of concern. When Congress a year or two ago put in an endowment tax on uh, high income or high uh, wealthy uh, colleges, I testified before the U.S. House Ways and Means Committee and unaccustomed as I am for favoring any tax, I said that a decent case could be made for that, uh, given the uh, way the endowment funds are being misused. And uh, uh, by the way, the higher ed community is brain dead when it comes to understanding how little public support they have now. Public support for universities is eroding rapidly. It's eroding mainly among conservatives and Republicans, but it's also eroding some among uh, even Democrats and liberals. And uh, colleges just don't realize they are utterly dependent on the public for their, their livelihood. They don't live off tuition fees alone. They can't live off state appropriation alone. They depend on my, or they, they, they do depend on state appropriation, but that's the public. That's the political process. They're utterly dependent on the political process, and they're saying, to hell with you, politicians. We know better than you. Uh, Harvard, yeah, did you hear about that case at Harvard? I wrote a piece called Harvard is an Embarrassment to Higher Ed, uh, which got 227,000 views, uh, which is uh, astronomical. This was in Forbes. And, you know, Harvard, uh, had a professor, African-American professor, they fired from his somewhat honorific job as being the head of uh, a dormitory, essentially, a house, Winthrop House, being dean of it. They, they fired him from it. He had been doing it for 10 years, done a fine job. They fired him. Why? Because he agreed to serve as an attorney to represent Harvey Weinstein. He... And this is, he did this his whole life. And the, the Harvard's view was Harvey Weinstein does not deserve any legal representation. Well, you know, that's kind of a basic premise of our democracy that everyone, no matter how heinous, no matter how idiotic, no matter how despicable, at least isn't entitled to an attorney. And uh, he was going to get paid and paid well for doing this. But so I wrote a piece about this and I had everyone in Cambridge Mass mad at me. I was told I should not show up at Cambridge Mass after uh, dark. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, I'm babbling here. Let's, let's, we need to move on. I, you know, yeah, we've got uh, two more questions. Yeah. Here, George Clues and then Tony Ciani. Uh, yeah, with regard to the performance of the universities, the, uh, I share your concerns with regard to the general outcomes in terms of students who are not able to write or, uh, yes. or don't know grammar even after additional four years. And then the second one, second point has to do with the monolithic ideas, just the left-wing ideas that yeah. students come out with. But then the third part has to do with the departments that uh, like music and engineering and chemistry where uh, you want one outcome but generally it's an outcome that you can measure. I mean either they can play the violin and the cello or yeah. well, they can't, sure. or either they can design a bridge or they can't. Do, and the, those departments seem able to 
produce they function other, reasonably are there well. any are there any lessons with regard to the way those departments are run and avoid the administrators that you can use with the other departments that's a good question i i think there are probably some lessons i'm not entirely sure how to articulate how i would do that but uh i've been thinking about that actually Within universities, there are enormous differences in outcomes, in intellectual content, in uh, even in professional ethics, to be honest with you. Uh, as I said, I wasn't kidding when I said, by the way, I wouldn't buy a used car from a university president. Uh, but, uh, and then there's the issue, what do you do about majors and gender studies and so forth where uh, students almost never get jobs in those fields, and we're subsidizing. Well, if we remove those subsidies, we're being accused of trying to, you know, do manipulation of what people can study and so forth. How do you deal with that? I think it's a, it's a, uh, uh, I, I just wouldn't fund them. But the point you raised earlier about converting the, the uh, university endowment or the grants to vouchers, wouldn't that help take care of that it, issue? Uh, it would be useful, very useful, uh, very useful. There are, thing, there are ways we can incentivize people uh, into, should we say, more productive uh, activity. Uh, I, God, I'd like to talk more with you about that, but I think we need to move on because of constraints. Oh. Hey, um, Anthony Ciani, I'm from here in Palatine, Illinois. Um, so, uh, hiring manager, and uh, we've had several applicants come through, and you always see they're um, graduated from various PhD programs, and uh, you know I almost feel uh, you know sorry for the schools that they've come through, letting such a uh, you know incompetence out of their programs, and um, y you know the uh, HR. It has to, um, you know, to, to fulfill requirements to get your H-1B hire in. You, you have to set up a standard for the position that you're hiring for, and as part of that standard, you need accredited degree programs. Uh, for diversity uh, requirements and non-discrimination requirements, you have to set up your, your hiring standards. You have to uh, include as part of those standards your accredited, accredited degree programs. And um, you know, every everywhere we we look, um, there is, uh, and and uh, Department of State, Department of Education, uh, Department of Labor, um, the the accredited degree program has become, um, you know, just built into the the entire system. So when you talk to the Chamber of Commerce, and say, why are you still, you know, taking, you know. Uh, people from the University of Tony who, who has been accredited by the a accreditation agency of Tony as a good school uh, when they're clearly not, um, you know, the, the chamber of the businesses really have no, um, no choice because it's been, it's been foisted upon them by government regulations from uh, multiple titles of, of the Code of Federal Regulations. Sure. And, um, so it was, it's just kind of, um, you know, one of the, the interesting things, um, I was looking at a, a, a post, so uh, made by the president of the Chicago Codings, uh, con, uh, I'm sorry, uh, consortium, but it's a, it's a, a, a league of, um, you know, codings companies, because Chicago used to be a, a really big uh, industrial center for codings companies. Um, and it's kind of interesting because he said when he started in the industry in the 1980s, you know, he was the first college graduate to work in their lab. Uh, their lab had been maintained by high school graduates that were doing all of the, the science and codings formulations. And now, of course, you need, we need um, a PhD in codings technology because, you know, codings, uh, so we've seen program bloat out of universities as well. So you get oh, a, a degree in codings technology. It's not, not a chapter in a book, not a not a, a, a week of study in some chemistry program, but you know, a course of study. Yeah, and I predict, by the way, that by 2025, 
you will need a master's degree in janitorial science to get a job as a janitor. I mean, one of the big problems is credential inflation in our country, where we're, you know, uh, and I, you don't, a bar today gets 30 applicants for a bartender's job. Ten of them have college, let's say 10 applicants. Five have college degrees, five don't. The bar owner doesn't want to interview 10 people. Too much time, too much hassle, too much business. It takes away from the business. So he or she arbitrarily excludes the non-college graduates, thinking the college graduates are probably going to be a little smarter, a little bit better, a little more disciplined. And chances are that's correct. So it now becomes required that you have a bachelor's degree in order to mix a martini. Uh, uh, whereas 30, 40 years, one, here's a statistic, one quick statistic. In 1970, for every 150 taxi drivers in the United States, one had a college degree, one out of 150. The 2010 census, it was up to 25. And it's probably around 35 or 40 now. You need a bachelor's degree to drive a cab or, or an Uber. Now, is that crazy or not? Anyway, we probably should. Yeah, so let's give Dr. Vetter a hand. Thank you.